if you can draw in the picture anything that you think is involved in your breathing, any structure that you think has something to do with breathing. And there's no right answer and there's no wrong answer. The only answer is what do you think? What's your map? Okay. I think I just allowed everyone to record. Um, so if you, this is gonna be a really valuable um, opportunity. Um, so I would recommend that everybody record so you have it all on your own. Can, can they do that? I believe everybody can record. Okay. And then Benson will record and put it in our Google Drive for future reference, but um, yeah. really but I, I, wouldn't want it, I wouldn't want it shared with other people. Okay, so nobody, if you share it, it's just for self-study and just so you don't have to be yeah. able to find it. Um, yeah. And I'll say that again, Lee, when, um, okay. when everybody's on and I, we make an announcement about um, the whole thing. Because I think, Dustin, can you let us know when we're all on here so that we can officially start once you see everybody? We got a couple more yeah. minutes. Anyway. Yeah, we got a couple more people too. We got 12 on so far. <sighs> you guys having fall down there? Are the leaves turning? We're having, I don't know if you all have been out on the roads or where, but like, it is beautiful. Like I was on the road yesterday and I was driving and there's this row of red trees. I'm probably gonna oh. post it. I opened up my sunroof. Yeah stuck my phone out and I was like driving because <laughs> it was just so stunning wow that's amazing it's really amazing are you where are you are you in Boston are you still in Newburyport or no I'm actually one town out of Newburyport in Byfield this okay. is I moved out into the country so it's very peaceful and quiet here I love it I love it so what's the fall doing up there is the foliage Becoming there. Some of the some of the maple trees have turned early and some of them haven't started yet, so it's a, kind of a crapshoot. <laughs> you never know when it's gonna be the best. I would like for everybody to who's here so far to check to see if Hi Lydia to, to check to see if you're able to record because I tried to give everybody record permission. We can. Okay, so once Dustin says we're all here, I'll make the announcement about the not sharing the recording and then we can start, probably start Lee with an introduction a little bit about your I'll, yeah, I'll my introduction. amazing work and so far, I think we're just waiting on four more. Sounds good. Elizabeth, I'm allowing you to record. Let me know if you can. And, okay. So what else can you chat about? <laughs> isn't it getting colder? Water, isn't the water getting a little cold, Nina? It is. Last Wednesday was cold. Yeah. <laughs> saw my five mile swim. Well, I've been swimming. There's a pool in my backyard. So I've been swimming every day up until the end of last week. And when it got down to 58 degrees, that was it for me. 60, I can handle. Oh. 58, without a wetsuit is too cold. Makes my head hurt. Yeah, it's insane. I, I have friends who like wear the cap and the hands and they like keep swimming like all through the end of October. I'm like, see ya. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. Um, good. Okay. Well, I'd like to go actually go ahead and get started because uh, we have a lot to cover today. I okay. want to make sure everybody gets a chance. Let me just uh, start by welcoming you. We're incredibly blessed to have her um, actually donating and supporting the WVU's Blues Studio with a very generous workshop. And um, 
Lee is like at the top of the field for breathing and body mapping and just the whole, you're gonna, you'll see all of it happen or little pieces of it um, and has a fabulous book. So without further ado, if you wanna further introduce yourself and then we can get moving. All right. Well, I am so excited to see all of you guys here. I love West Virginia. I got to live in Ohio for 18 years and we would go over there frequently. It's so beautiful. So I want to I want to invite you to imagine that it's Saturday morning or Sunday morning and you're just waking up in bed. Oh, please just Got a fair, you don't have anything, and you're just noticing how you breathe. You're breathing so warm and so free, and there's no like, ah, I have to get up and get everything done. You're just feel with that like when you're just completely at ease and comfortable, and you can just however you want. Flute, yeah, <laughs> yeah, no kidding. No kidding. So what I've asked you to do as we get started is just draw what I would call your map of your breathing structures. And this is just really your, your, the only right answer is what you think. So whatever you think is involved in breathing, you go right ahead and just put that in. There is no wrong answer. Okay. So, you know, I, I, had a really tough time playing the flute. When I was in college, when I was uh, about 19, 18, 19, I was playing eight hours a day. I was in ensembles and orchestras and practicing, and my left hand started to go numb. And it blew my mind. I didn't know what was going on. So I went to my teacher and I said, what's going on here? And my teacher said, I don't know. I went to another teacher. They said, I don't know. I went to the clinic at Mass General Hospital in Boston and they watched me play and they said, we don't see anything wrong with your playing. And I was still in pain and still had the numbness in my left hand. So at that point, all I knew how to do was just play less. So I said, okay, well, I'm not going to practice as much because I want to play in my ensembles. You know, it was a trade off, but that was the beginning of a 30 year journey of pain for me. I played the flute in pain for 30 years. A couple of times I had to stop because it, sometimes it would just hurt so much that I'd look at my flute and cry because I just couldn't imagine playing without incredible amount of pain. It started in my hands and went up through my shoulders, my neck, my back and my legs. Finally, where I just was in pain all the time with everything. And it didn't, I couldn't really figure out what to do about it until I was about 45. And then I realized, oh, it's not my fault. It's not that I'm wrong or I don't know how to practice or I don't know what to do. It's that nobody ever taught me how to use my body when I'm playing. Nobody in all the years that I studied my instrument. And I know this true for a lot of people. I also know that you all are incredibly lucky to be in Nina's studio where you can do all this movement and have all this fun and engagement, which most people, frankly, don't get to do in college. So I could tell you a lot more about that journey, but the way that it's related to breathing is that basically I was so tight and so tense that I could never get a good breath. And I, I couldn't figure it out. It's like, why can't I get enough air? Why can't I make it last as long as I want? I don't know. I'm trying to do all the things that people are telling me to do. But what I understand now is that I was just, I had a lot of tension in my shoulders and my neck that was keeping my breathing muscles from moving the way they needed to move for free breathing. So what I get to do now, once I figured out how to do all that and get rid of all that pain, it, it, it took me two years to learn how to breathe, by the way, two years, okay? So if you're struggling with it, don't worry about it. <laughs> You'll get it faster than I did. But I now I get to work with people around the world, incredible musicians, just helping them figure out how to play with ease and bring back the joy. Because there's so many people who started out playing with joy and then they got into all this hard work and they lost the joy of making music. And 
it's affecting us a little bit right now in this whole you know pandemic situation joy can be hard to find so we'll bring a little bit of joy here today and i just i just really want you to if even if you know some of this information already come at it with a beginner's mind a new approach a curiosity oh what what else could i learn what else could i figure out so welcome I'm excited. You could, if you've drawn on your drawing, just put it aside. We'll look at it again at the end. Um, and just whatever you put on there is fine. So I want to ask you a question. Yeah, your question, Nina. Refer to uh, the drawing, um, like maybe put it up so they know, because I think only about six students were here when you opened it up on the screen. Okay, they should have. Did you send it to them all? Yeah. Okay, they should have a handout in their email. So it's the drawing yeah. of the body that she's talking about. Outline, just the outline of the body. Yeah. Great. Thank you for that reminder. So I'm going to invite you to post in the chat right now. What are, because I want to know, what are the challenges that you have with breathing? Is it stuff like getting enough air or making it last or support? Just go ahead and write it in the chat because I'm dying to find out. Breathing silently. Okay. Timing and how much, making my ear last, taking quiet breaths. Yep. Fantastic. Support, lasting, fast breaths. Yep. Taking in enough air, support, and having effortless breaths. Great. Breathing without throat tension. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. These are really um, actually common flute issues. Uh, making it last. So a lot about quiet breaths, a lot of, and throat tension, which is related. A lot about making the air last. Okay. Fantastic. Thank you for sharing that. I really appreciate that. So we're going to talk about, this This workshop is actually called um, Myths, wait, what's it official? Oh, Busting Breathing Mysteries and Myths. So there are three really big myths that I encounter among um, flute players especially, and I work with all musicians, whether they're flute players or not. <clears throat> first myth, the first myth is that the diaphragm is support, is for support. So I'm gonna show you what is the real secret role of the diaphragm. The second myth is that you always have to take big breaths. And, and this is gonna show you why you really can't get enough air. And the third myth is that sitting up straight is the best way to get to get more air. And I'm gonna show you how that actually makes breathing worse. All right, so here we go. Myth number one, the diaphragm is support, is for support. So the word diaphragm, um, you probably know this, but any word that has an A-G-M in it, there's a G before the M, is Greek. And uh, Nina probably knows this too. Um, <laughs> The word itself actually means like a fence or a partition. So the diaphragm is a partition. Who knows what it's a partition between? What do you imagine that it's separating? Yeah, one. Um, the stomach viscera and the lungs. Uh, yeah, basically the chest cavity and the abdominal cavity. So it's the, it's the barrier, the partition between those two, and it basically covers the entire area except for a couple holes for the blood vessels and the esophagus to go through. Yeah. So in your mind and in your picture, think about what the diaphragm looks like. You may have seen a picture before you may not have. So I was told that it's a sheet of muscle many times by people who had never looked at a picture of the diaphragm. So think about what your picture is like and then see if it's anything like this. This is a picture of an actual diaphragm. So what do you, what, tell me, somebody tell me something that seems interesting to them about this picture that they didn't know. Just hold up your hand. Something that's different from what you didn't know. Yeah, uh, is it Jacob? Yeah. Um, I would probably say like the layering to it. I think normally when we talk about the diaphragm, like you said, like people tend to just think about the sheet and kind of like an art. Whereas yeah. this has layers to it. Yeah, well, it's actually one, it is one layer of muscle, 
But these fibers you see are the way the muscle fibers move. They move up and down like this. Um, up, right up here is what's part called the tendon. And then right here is the notch where your sternum attaches. But yeah, it's much more like, some people call it like a shower cap. I think that's a really uh, useful analogy. It's, it's not squishy like a shower cap, but it does drape kind of like a shower cap. And it has that really domed shape. And when it moves, it goes, I'll show you how to do this. Take your fingers and interlace them like this. And then turn them over so your palms are facing the ground. And then just flatten them. So here's your dome with it most, most rise position. And then here it is in its most flattened. Exhale. Exhale. So that's the first thing. Look like in your head, this is your your map actually controls how you breathe. Where, where do you believe the diaphragm is? You need to stand up to show me that that's okay too. Okay. okay. Great. So we've got a few different ideas here. Yeah, thank you. Fantastic. Um, what's really interesting about the diaphragm is that it is up, I'm going to show you this picture too, inside your ribs, okay? It never goes below your ribs. So those of you who are pointing right here to, but to the solar plexus, yeah, it goes up higher than that actually. And see this, see this dip right here? There's a dip, that's where your heart rests. So find your heart, okay? And that's where the top, the bottom of your heart and the top of your diaphragm are in the same place. The heart actually rests on your diaphragm. So I'm going to show you, I have my special um, breathing t-shirt called a skeleton, which I use when I'm teaching breathing because it's so much fun. Plus it's, it's October, right? Halloween time. So here are my ribs. See if you can find the edge of your ribs right here, okay? You can kind of dig around and feel them. And then the diaphragm is up inside that, way up inside. So when it flattens, it never goes below the ribs. That's so if, if somebody throws a spear at you, you're not going to die. Because the diaphragm stops moving, you die. All right. So here's the big question. And this is going to explain to you why you can't use the diaphragm for support. Muscle fibers can do two things. They can get closer together and they can get further apart. So they can shorten, the overall length of a muscle can shorten or it can lengthen. So you saw those fibers of the diaphragm, right? So when they shorten, they're going down this way. When they lengthen, they're going back up, all right? So here's the question, and this is a, this is a mapping question. In, what do you believe? When do you believe the diaphragm does its work? When you inhale or when you exhale? Go ahead and type in the chat. Do you believe the diaphragm works? In other words, the muscles work. Like when you do this, there's muscles working. When you inhale or when you exhale? Go ahead and type inhale or exhale in the chat. Inhale, inhale, exhale, exhale. Inhale. I love it. We're getting all mixed answers. Exhale. Inhale. Fantastic. Isn't this great? A whole studio of flute players and we have different answers. There can only be one actual answer that's accurate with how the body is designed. And there's a reason for it. Okay. So when, what brings the air in? Think about this. You know that there has to be a vacuum created so that the air rushes in. You get oxygen. Is the diaphragm pulling down? Okay. It's contracting and shortening, creates a vacuum, and the air rushes in. That means that it's working when you inhale. So if it's working when you inhale, if the fibers are going closer together when you inhale, what are they doing when you exhale? They're releasing. The diaphragm is releasing when you exhale. 
So let's just try a little experiment with this. Go ahead. You cannot feel the diaphragm. I think you all know this, but if somebody did shoot a spear through it, you wouldn't feel it because there's no sensory nerves there. But just take a few breaths where you feel like you're working for the air to come in. And then take a few breaths where you feel like you're working to push the air out. And see if either one feels more natural to you. And you don't have to work like work, just that there's something happening. It's like when you bend your arm, there are muscles working, but they're not working. Yeah. So how many people have been told to, regardless of any time in your life, have been told to support with the diaphragm? More diaphragm. You need more support. Use the diaphragm, right? Ah! It drives me crazy. You cannot breathe without the diaphragm. There is no such thing as non-diaphragmatic breathing. Everybody uses the diaphragm to breathe. You can't, otherwise, you die. All right. So what this leads us to the question of what is support. If you can't feel the diaphragm, what are you doing to support the air? Well, in the old days, and some of you may have been taught this. I hope you weren't because things are changing. But I was taught... I should be able to tighten my muscles, my abdominal muscles, so much right here that my teacher could come along and punch me in the stomach and it wouldn't hurt. So go ahead, tighten up your abs, really make them really hard so that you can poke yourself, you know, and you're protecting yourself, all right? That's what I was taught is support. Was anybody else taught that? Yeah, some of us. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry you were taught that. Because the problem with teaching that is that you're isolating all the work in one place. You're getting your muscles really tight and you're actually limiting other muscles. So I have a new, that, to me, that's the old definition of support and it creates a certain amount of rigidity. I'm going to experiment and playing with this in a minute. So I hope you have your instruments nearby. I have a new definition of support. And this is a definition that promotes freedom and ease. And that is that support is a whole body activity. You feel response through your whole body. This is why it's so much fun to move when you play. And what you're doing is distributing the effort. You're not isolating it all in one place here. You're not isolating it here, but you're distributing the work through your whole body. And you're going to use different amounts of work depending on what you're playing. If you lift a feather, it's not going to take much work, right? But if you lift a box of books, that's going to take a lot more work, a lot more connection to the ground, a lot more support. So let's get your flutes out. And I'm going to invite you to do this nice little etude. Make sure everybody's muted. I think you are. And what I'm going to invite you to do is think of each exhalation as a release, okay? So this is not about how long can you play that note. It's just make every breath like a sigh. <sighs> so you can just have this sense that everything is releasing as you play. You can stand or sit. I don't care. Go, ahead, go for it. And if you don't have a flute, you can imagine doing it, airplay. Okay, beautiful. Now, let's forget what we just did and go back and play your normal habitual way and see if there's any difference. Okay, great. Does anybody notice any difference between those two ways of breathing? Yeah, Catherine, what are you noticing? Um, I definitely try and hold on to the air more when I normally breathe. I'm not just letting it go. Okay, and what muscles are you using to hold on to the air? Do you know? Uh, probably upper abdominal muscles. Okay, all right, great. Nathan, what did you notice? You had your hand up. Um, 
Um, for me, I could feel that I was a little bit more tense when I was doing my regular breathing as compared to mm -hmm. basically just releasing it. So it felt yeah. like relaxing when I was doing that. Yeah, yeah. And, and I don't know if any of you noticed, but if you're creating a little bit of tension, it's going to create tension in your throat as well. So there's, there is a sense of release. And sometimes we feel like we have to brace our bodies. And so this is, you're going to start one asking yourself, when I take a breath, am I creating some kind of resistance or bracing in an effort to support the air? So that kind of thing I'm going to invite you to experiment with a lot and just see, okay, how am I thinking about the diaphragm? But since I'm not going to feel it, I'm going to feel the reaction of everything below it. On the pelvic floor, we, we, by the way, this is just a tiny bit of the breathing work that I do. We could be here for three hours, I think, are going to really really helpful. So how many of you found something interesting about the diaphragm that you didn't know before? Yeah, cool. Awesome. Awesome. All right. Very good. So here's our second myth. And, and you may know this already. If you do, I'm really happy for you. But I was taught, and a lot of people are taught, you always have to take in as much air as you can. So we call tank up. Then take another breath on top of that. If you really want to be able to play afternoon of the fun, you have to get completely full of air. So everybody do that. Take a big breath. Take another breath on top of that. Tank up a little more. And how does that feel? You feel nice and free and easy? No, you're creating a ton of tension. So this is actually often what keeps us from getting enough air. So go ahead and do that. Do that and play. So take like three breaths, a big one, and then one on top of it, and one on top of that. And go ahead and play that again. So just notice how that feels in your body, what happens in your throat, what happens in your belly. So the thing is, that breathing is a whole body experience. When you breathe, this is my guy, Captain Bob. He says, hell, hell, hello, that's bones over there. When you breathe, if you go to a, a cat that's sleeping or a dog or a baby, and you put one hand on their head and one hand on the bottom of the foot, you will feel movement through the entire body when they breathe, even the plates in your skull, which you think of as immovable, actually move a little bit. There's, a, there's an x-ray movie of that. These things are actually moving a little bit when you breathe. Everything in your body can move if you don't get tense. So I ask you a question. Everybody unmute yourself. And tell me what you had for breakfast. Here we go. One, two, three, go. Coffee. Oh. <laughs> All right. So most people said like one thing, right? Oh, I had How much air did you take in before you said that one thing? Did you go <gasps> cereal? <laughs> you didn't even breathe at all. But you've got enough air in your lungs for one word. All right. Now we're gonna. I'm gonna ask you another question. Tell me on like the busiest day of your life. Tell me in one breath. Everything you had to do on that day. Here we go. One, two, three, go. Go to class. Write a paper. <laughs> yeah, so could you do it all in one breath? Who was able to do it all in one breath? Was that breath different from how you breathed before you said cereal? Yeah, why? Why was that a different breath? Uh, Jacob's friend, what's your name? You're nodding your head. Lydia. Lydia, hi. Why was that different from saying cereal? Um, I guess because I was preparing to say more. So Yeah, you had a lot more to say. 
Do you think music is that way? Guess what? Yeah, you have something to say in music. So if I'm just going... All I need is enough air to play that phrase. I don't need... Can you see all the tension in my neck and shoulders when I do that? So one of the really fun ways that you can figure out how much air you need is just to sing. Just to sing your phrase, that'll help you. But there's a really other fun way, and that is to learn to take a reflexive breath. So here's what I'm going to ask you to do. Blow out all your air, and don't breathe. Just wait, okay? You're going to want to grip, but don't grip. Just sit there nice and calmly. You can still let some air come out. I'm still exhaling. Just keep it all coming out until, until your body says breathe, and then just let the air come in. Yeah, let's do that one more time. Blow your air out and keep blowing out for as long as you possibly can. Just keep blow, blow. Even if it's a tiny bit, just keep blowing to the end. And then when you can't wait any longer, let your body breathe. Yeah, so I'm going to ask a couple of you. What was that? Sammy, I could see you doing something really interesting. Can I ask? Is it Sammy? Yeah. yeah. Notice about that. Um, everything opened up. So I feel like sometimes when I go to prepare a really big breath when I'm playing, it's very tight and I can feel the air hitting the sides of everything. When I do the reflexive breath, everything just expands and makes room for what I need. Did you get enough air? Plenty. Yeah. And how hard, what, how much work did you have to do? I mean, the only work was not breathing until I absolutely needed it. <laughs> because it's a reflex. A reflex is something that happens automatically, okay? Like a hiccup or something like that, all right? So here's the deal. We are used, to, a lot of us are used to thinking, okay, I got to get a breath, big breath so I can get through this piece. All you have to do is think about how much air do I need for this phrase so that I can be at the end of my exhalation at the end of the phrase. You see the difference? You don't want to have air left over at the end of the phrase because then you're going to be working harder to bring more in. You want to have that natural flow, that natural release of the sigh so that by the end of the phrase, it's just, it's automatic. The air just comes in. And I call, I've actually pretty much stopped using the word taking a breath because that's like, taking a breath. I'm going to grab all that air quick before it runs out. No, all I say is just let's allow a breath. Let's receive a breath. So let's play again and just do the same thing. So you're just going to, you don't need much air to begin with. And when you're all out of air and you're not gripping, allow another breath to come in and do a few notes that way. Okay, this is awesome. Somebody, I'd like to know something that somebody noticed. Somebody who hasn't spoken yet, I'd love to know what you noticed. Just raise your hand if you have something that you could share. I'm going to pick on somebody if you don't raise your hand. Elizabeth, I'm going to pick on you. What did you notice about that? <laughs> um, I noticed I know when I breathe, it just feels really, really tight. So I noticed I wasn't as tight and it just felt more open. Mm, fantastic. Yes, I see Jacob and, and uh, I forgot your name already. Sorry. <laughs> what muscles do you think you are normally tightening up 
that weren't tightening that time? Um, I'm not sure. I don't know what muscles exactly. It, it just felt a lot more free than it did before. Okay. All right, great. Who else has something they want to share? I'm going to pick on you. Yeah, uh, well, you've spoken before. I want somebody who hasn't spoken. Sky, do you, did you notice anything? Um, yeah, I would say the same thing. It just felt a lot more open than previous breaths. Great, great. So what's actually happening is that because your muscles are basically used up and then they just, wee, they just open, the rib muscles are working better, the diaphragm is working better, and what's really interesting about this is that, and we're not going to spend much time all your muscles are releasing the muscles that go straight up and down there's muscles that go diagonally all the way around when you inhale so let's just do a quick little experiment Use your belly muscles to pull in air, okay? So all around your belly, use those muscles to suck in air. Make them work hard. And notice how different that is from the allowing. They are supposed to be free when you inhale. And most of us don't do that for a lot of reasons, which I'm going to tell you in a minute. So I'm going to make sure we have time for some questions in a little bit. So if you have a question, write it down. But I want to get through this third myth um, because this is really important. How many of you have been told to sit up or stand up straight at some point in your life? Yeah, oh yeah. And how does that feel? Go ahead, sit up straight, stand up straight right now. How does that feel? Yeah, so is it, is it Cor Corissa? Carissa, yes. Carissa, Hi. yeah. So what does that feel like when you sit up straight? Um. I feel like this is my life. I'm always trying to, but um, it feels a little stiff. Yeah, yeah. And why are you always trying to sit up straight? Stand up straight? Um, well, I've taken modeling classes and also with my flute playing, like they, they teach you how to, you know, your clothes fit better if you sit up straight and stuff like that. Yeah. So it trains okay. in everything I do. Yeah. Okay. So I want to make something really clear to y'all, which is that, what you learn in yoga and in dance class and in ballet and in gymnastics and in figure skating is not what you need when you play the flute. All right. We, the last thing we want to do is lift our chest, pull our shoulders back and down and arch our back. So go ahead and do that. Lift your chest, shoulders back and down, tuck your butt. That's what also people say and take a breath. Allow a breath. Can you allow a breath? How does that feel? It feels crappy, doesn't it? Yeah, it's so tight. So this whole idea that we're supposed to sit up straight is a horrible myth that has caused so much destruction among flute players and a whole lot of other people. And I want to really get this straight. So what I'm going to have you do is... Ugh, I have bones all over my house. All right. This is a pelvis. It's a female pelvis, which means that it's a little bit shallower and it's wider because the head of a baby has to fit through here. If you ever have a baby, whether you have a baby or not, it's still big enough for the head of a baby. So feel, see right here, below your hip joints are your sit bones. So I'm going to invite you to sit now and put your hands under your sit bones, okay? Just see if you can sit on your hands. If you're on a really hard chair, it might be too hard, but go ahead and sit on, your, sit on your hands if you can, and go into a nice slump. All right, where did your sit bones just go? Did you feel them go forward? Yeah. Now roll through them and sit up straight. Arch your back, lift your chest. Where did your sit bones just go? They went back behind you, right? So do that a few times, rolling through. And see if you can find the place in the middle where you feel an incredible amount of weight on your hands. That means the entire weight of your torso is coming right down into those sit bones. 
should be somewhere in the middle. And when you find that place, just take your hands out and let yourself sit on your sit bones. Yeah, it might be a little harder on the floor. I don't know. I've never tried it on the floor, actually. But go ahead and allow yourself to sit right on your sit bones. All right. And again, let's, let's do that one more time. You don't have to sit on your hands again, but go into a slump and breathe. You might feel a lot of movement in your back, but it's, you're probably going to be a little crunched in front. Go ahead and sit up straight and breathe and feel how your abdominal muscles are all engaged. Your back muscles are all engaged, trying to hold you up. And it's hard to breathe because you can't release those abdominal muscles. Now drop your tailbone a little bit and let yourself come back into that balanced place where you're sitting right on your sit bones and breathe. Who notices a difference? Yeah, um, somebody who hasn't spoken yet. Yeah, JC, what do you notice? Um, it's a little bit hard because I'm sitting on the floor, so I think it's a little bit different than if I was on a bench or something. But I do notice a difference in like how I feel when I'm like hunched forward a little bit as opposed to if I try to sit up straighter. Um, and when I did it when I was like hunched forward a little bit, I noticed that it was like maybe not harder to breathe, but it just didn't feel as free flowing and natural as before. Yeah, yeah, great. Thank you. What about the other JC? JC, are you two JCs or are you just on a JC thing? No, yeah, it's two JCs. Really? Okay, spelled the same way. How oh, awesome. And what did you notice? Um, when I, I was sitting on the sit bones in the relaxed position, it definitely just, it just felt better. In More, what way did it feel better? It just felt easier to breathe. Easier to breathe. Cool. Because your muscles were able to do what they're supposed to do. So let's play around with this just really quick. I want you to get your flute and you can play. If you're muted, you can play whatever you want. I don't care. But play for a little bit in a slouch. Then play for a little bit sitting up too straight. And then see if you can sit in balance on your sit bones. You can also do this standing if you want. But I think in the beginning it's easier to do it sitting. And see what feels different to you. Go ahead. Um, I would start with one note. Actually, it's easier to find. Go ahead and play. We'll see what happens. Beautiful, beautiful work. Go ahead and type into the chat, what did you notice about playing slumped, playing too straight, or playing more in balance? More space to breathe and balance. Yes. Felt open and sound. More connected. I love that. Yes. Open my sound. Breath was more relaxed, more grounded. A lot of freedom and relaxed and balance. Slump felt surprisingly good. <laughs> Straight up was tight. Balance was good. Yes. As my teacher, Barbara Conable, used to say, there's nothing wrong with a good slump. Especially in we're times when we're working so hard and we're exhausted. We just need to go... Oh, yeah, these are beautiful. Down, lack of control, too straight, tense, balance, loose, and free. Wow, this is fantastic. So why would you not want to be in balance all the friggin' time, right? This is a challenge. And especially when you're moving and you guys are doing a lot of movement, I know. So it's probably easier to be in balance when you're moving. Harder to be when you're just sitting still in a rehearsal or something like that or when you're practicing. So don't ever have to be still. You can move all the time. But start 
exploring that balance because I want to tell you two other reasons why this is really, really important. The first is um, we talked about the front abdominal muscles a little bit before. But let's look at these. Actually, I have a better picture for you. Sorry. Let's look at the back muscles, all right? So when you sit up straight, these muscles right here, all of these back muscles are going to tighten. Here's your trapezius for those of you who know that. These, look at these big muscles right here. These are your lats. You see what they wrap around? They wrap right around your ribs. Then when you sit up straight, these muscles, all the muscles contract in the direction of their fibers. So go ahead and put your hand on your lower back right here. Yep. And sit up straight and feel what happens to that part of your lower back. It's kind of two things that are happening here. Your pressure ribs, ribs can't move freely. And the second thing is that these lats are actually arm muscles. They're the muscles that pull your arm down and in. I mean, in the gym, you're doing this pull down, all right? What do you submit to your muscles when those muscles are tight? You're tightening up all your arms. You're actually making yourself more at risk for injury and nerve compression, which is what I had. Yikes. So you don't need to do that. But here's the other thing that is really incredibly related to breathing. All right. When we breathe, this part of your spine, which is called the thoracic spine, meaning the part of your spine is in your chest, the part of the spine where all 24 ribs are attached, okay? Each one of these ribs has a joint, and they need to pivot. I'm going to show you on my T-shirts. You can see that as well. Lots of joints in the back. 24 of them, all the way through here. If I lift my chest like this, instead of the spine being able to bend a little back in space to make more room for those joints to move. It's supposed to actually just curve back a little in space so there's more room for these ribs to pivot. If instead you make it do this and you flatten it, you're really limiting rib movement. So go ahead and put your hand on your upper back, like right between your shoulder blades if you can, and lift your chest just a little. Can you feel how that flattens that spine? This is really bad for us. It not only limits the, it limits our breathing, but it's also pressing the collarbone down on our nerves and a whole bunch of other stuff about that. So this is why, <clears throat> go ahead, leave your hand back there and now breathe and allow your spine to go back into your, so it's like breathing into your upper back. Can you feel that there can be movement there? Now make it flat and breathe again without breathing into your back. Is there a difference? Juan, what do you say? What are you noticing? Yeah, I think immediately I, I even felt like some shoulder pain as I breathe because it just all felt like really tight. Yeah. Yeah. So this is not your typical breathing lesson, but I hope there's a lot in here that you can begin to play around with and get curious about. I don't want you to think, oh, I'm right or I'm wrong. I just want you to get curious about how things are working. And uh, you will, if you're recording, you will have the recording for yourself. I do ask that you don't share it with people. This is really just for your private um, use. If you find somebody who wants to learn more about it, have them contact me. But let's take some questions now. What is this all bringing up for you? What are you curious about? What do you want to know more about? Yeah, one. So in my practice, I find that I tend to feel tense in certain places, like at the base of my neck, I feel a lot of tension. How do I learn to isolate what exactly I'm doing to cause that? Great question. Um, <laughs> I would, I would actually reframe it um, and take out the word isolate 
And think about it. Everything you do is connected to everything else. So what is it about the way I'm using my body that's causing tension in my neck? There can be a bunch of things, and it usually has to do with balance and the way you're standing and sitting. So if I am, and you all need to be taking videos of yourself from the side, if you are pushing your head forward even a little bit, all right, it's going to go off balance. Your head needs to be in balance in the same way you need to be in balance on your sit bones. And as soon as that starts to go off balance, your neck muscles are going to start to go crazy because they think your head's going to fall off. And they're going, ah, don't fall off. And so they get tight. So this is, you know, this is actually um, a music, musical problem and a cultural problem. Most of us are spending a lot of time doing this, right? It's the worst thing a musician can do because it's going to hurt your neck muscles and it's going to put pressure on the nerves to your hands. That's what happened to me. Although I didn't know, but nobody knew how to tell me that. Yeah. Um, so that's, does that make sense? Now, I'd have to watch you play and, and kind of coach you through that. I'm actually doing um, a whole three workshops in November on Saturdays called um, Jaw and Neck Pain, which will address that. And then three workshops in December about standing and sitting with comfort and joy. Uh, so that will also address it. But we have to be, the whole body has to be in balance. So I actually want to address what you all said about taking quick breaths. All right. So think about how much work you do when you breathe. And you've discovered already a lot of things that are not so free when you're breathing. If there is tension in your body, you cannot take quick, easy breaths. You cannot take quiet breaths. You cannot breathe just what you need is the freedom of that reflexive breath, okay? And it's not going to be there if there's other tension. So it's a process. It's really taking quick breaths is actually the last thing we learn to do. Yes, Nina, I'd be happy to send you those, that information so you can share it. Yeah. Yeah. More questions? Yeah. Ethan, what's your question? Um. So if you're standing up, how can you find that perfect balance spot as if when you're sitting? That's something okay. I see. I'm going to show you. And I'm also going to reframe your question. There is no such thing as perfect balance. And there's no such thing as a spot. All right. Balance is about movement. You cannot be balanced if you're stiff. Right? It's all, it might be micro movement, the way the military musicians have to stand at attention for two hours at a time. You think they make themselves stiff? Yeah, JC, I see your question. Okay, so let's do a really quick, a really quick, easy way of doing this. And let's move a little bit because we haven't moved. Everybody stand up, get yourselves up. Yay. All right, here we go. We're gonna do 10 jumping jacks. Here we go, and one, two, three, four, five. Those arms up there. Eight, nine, ten. Okay, great. Now, Ethan, just stand there. Tell me how you feel. Notice how you feel in your legs and your feet and your balance in your body. Um, I kind of felt more relaxed, honestly. I felt like my blood rushing through my legs and kind of started yeah. to get... Yes. You feel more relaxed because you're more connected to the ground. You're getting more support from the ground, which is going to allow these muscles to be more in balance and up and Okay. JC, that's, that's like the five second version. I could go on for an hour, but that's a start. Yeah. There's a bunch of stuff in my book about that as well. Okay. Which JC are we doing? That was me. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, I can. Uh -huh. Oh, sorry. The webcam on my laptop doesn't work and I lost connection on my phone. So unfortunately you won't be able to see me. Um, but um, I really resonate with what you said at the beginning of the class about um, when you were practicing, you were just in immense pain. And I'm going through the same thing. I have um, pain in my wrists a lot, but really it's just horrendously bad in my back lately. And like I've had back and shoulder pain for years, but it's just gotten to the point where I have to stop practicing sometimes because I'm about to cry in pain from it. 
And I went to the doctor about it the other day and they're sending me to like physical therapy and things like that. Um, I never knew the breathing might have an impact on that. I always just assumed it was like bad posture and things like that. And maybe it is, but I was wondering if you knew of any like exercises or things that we could do for like upper back pain and things that would make um, practicing a little more bearable sometimes. Oh, well, thank you for sharing that, JC. I am so sorry. I know, I've been there, done that. I know how hard that is. And it took me three years to get out of pain. But that was the beginning. What I would like to do actually is offer to watch you play, to do a video, a complimentary video session with you. Because I'm, I'm not going to tell you anything that's just some, you know, general thing about practicing. I want to see what it is about how you're thinking about using your body because how we think about using our body, our maps, controls how we move. Um, and it could be, there could be one thing, there could be 20, Sounds uh, you. contact information so you can Um, look at that. All right. Is there anybody else that has a question? Yes, Catherine. So when you were saying that, like, we definitely don't use diaphragm for support, like, are there any muscles you recommend we do engage? Or is it more like you should expel all your air, use a reflexive breath, and then repeat the process? Well, that's a $64 million question. <laughs> so first of all, support is not one thing. It's dynamic it changes depending on whether you're playing you know a low d piano or a high 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 d fortississimo it's going to be a different amount of work and a different amount of connection with your body but two things are important one is that it's a whole body experience you don't just support with certain muscles and two is that you want to get clear on what are the muscles that are involved in making the lungs smaller. So the muscles between your ribs that pull the ribs down together, the muscles in your abdomen, they are contracting when you exhale in opposition to the diaphragm. So the diaphragm is releasing, the abdominal muscles are contracting. But if you do this with your arm, okay, my bicep muscles are contracting here, the triceps are extending, now the triceps are, are contracting, the biceps are extending. How much work is that? It's not much, but you can make it really hard work, right? Make a big fist and tighten up all those muscles. This is not how you want to feel when you're playing the flute. <laughs> but that being said, it is going to take more work to play loud and high. So what really helps, and as I said, this is just the tip of the iceberg of learning about breathing. You can, you can study what's in my book. We can talk about this some more, but you, it's really a matter of understanding what are the muscles and what quality of movement do you want in those muscles to move the air. Does that help? Yes. Okay. Fantastic. So I'm going to invite you all to take a look at your picture now that you drew in the beginning, your map, your map of breathing structures. What would you draw differently now? Who sees something that they would change now? Hold up your hand. Sammy, what would you change? I'm just going to show you. So the dark blue is like my representation of what I thought involved. And then the light blue is after your class. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. And just the, the idea that your whole body has to be relaxed. I feel like so often we focus on relaxing specific areas. And I know a couple of people use the word isolating today. And I think that's so much of what we do. Um, and now realizing it, you can't isolate if you want to have the freedom of the relaxation. Yeah, yeah. Isolation is something you do in jazz dance class where you're you know, moving just one part of your body. Um, and the rest of it is trying to be stable to be, and, and I don't actually even use the word relax anymore. I usually use the word free. If I want to be free, I want my muscles to be able to do whatever I want them to do, depending on what I want to do with the music. So yeah, I think that's a great, great comment. Yeah. Thanks, Sammy. Who else has something they want to change about their drawing? 
Everybody had a perfect drawing? Yeah, Dustin, what would you change? I, uh, my diaphragm was way too low. I needed to move it up. <laughs> yeah, so what does it feel like to breathe when you think your diaphragm is way down in your belly? I mean, your and belly it, tends to stick out when you breathe in. Yeah, and what does it feel like to breathe mapping your diaphragm in its actual location? I feel like the whole front of the body, like there's more, less isolated movement, like in the stomach, like where I think your actual stomach yeah. is. It sounds like it's less work also. That's fantastic. There's a perfect example of how your map controls how you move. You have your diaphragm mapped somewhere down in your belly. It's not going to feel right to breathe. It's going to feel weird and extra work. So, okay, great. I'm going to, I'm going to post um, my contact information here. Um, so hang on one second while I do that, and then I'm just going to end up with a couple, of, um, a couple of comments at the end. So hang on. I don't use screen share a lot anymore because I'm just so tired of trying to make it work. Okay. Can you see that? All right. Thank you, Nina, for inviting me. I want to, I want, you guys can all friend me on Facebook. I have a lot of videos on Facebook that I, that I do. Um, you feel free to email me like JC for a complimentary consultation if you're struggling. You can go to my website, musicminuspain.com. i got a lot of stuff going on. But I, what I want you to do is go back to that image, that imagination of waking up on a Saturday or Sunday morning and you're just, ugh, oh, everything is so soft and easy and free. <sighs> and it's just so, every breath, whether you're taking, whether a breath is coming in or a breath is going out, everything is a release. Every, there's always some muscles releasing, whether you're inhale or exhaling. And I just think of that, I think of breathing as like an extended sigh. So one of, the last thing I invite you to do is just write in the chat your biggest takeaway for today. What's your biggest takeaway that you want to remember and take home with you? Sunday morning breath. <laughs> Love it. Everything is a release. Yep. Breathe without. Sometimes it does take force, you know, for those high, high Ds. But not all the time. Whole body. All right. Play through like side. Yes. That is fantastic. I love your comments. You guys have been amazing. Wonderful work. Nina, any last thoughts before we close? I, I just want to thank you. And I, I know this is really meaningful to our students because we have these conversations. And, and even for me, with what I know about breathing, I learn new things. And, and it's like you never stop learning and you never stop needing to be reminded. And I want everyone to you know, think about having some sessions with Lee if you're able at some point in time um, because it would be highly valuable. And also, I really encourage buying her book. It's like, in my opinion, like one of the best books. Um, yeah, about 27, 28 bucks. Yeah. You guys have it in the library? We probably do. I think I ordered like $2,000 worth of stuff like four years ago. Yeah, it definitely should be in the library. Yeah, I've asked Dustin to um, gather up your contact and your website, and also Dustin, if you could add the whole thing. Um, I have the whole thing in the studio. Yeah, it's either in the studio or in my home studio, but um, you can also take a peek. I'm pretty sure it's in the school studio um, up on the right hand side. So um, it's just been wonderful, and also just your smiling face and beautiful warm personality <laughs> it's like so nice to learn something and not feel stressed out right everybody <laughs> oh god my heart goes out to all of you i think it's amazing what you guys are doing i just i 
I would find it very hard to do what you're doing. I'm just in my little room all the time. <laughs> so thank you guys. Thank you so much. Please stay in touch. Have a beautiful day. And I hope to see you again soon. You're going to stay and talk to JC or are you guys like emailing JC? Or oh, email? JC, send me an email or a private message. Friend me on Facebook. Yep. Okay. All right, thank you. Thank you. Bye.